Bayonetta 3 is literally on the horizon and the Japanese website gave us some confirming new story details that will change Bayonetta forever. I repeat, I am going to break down, yes, all the new footage from the Japanese Nintendo website. 3, 2, 1. The first cinematic you see are two meteor-like streams, which then one of them crashes onto the Statue of Liberty's face. So this is definitely after the events of the Battle of New York, and therefore I am so excited, oh my god. Therefore we finally have confirmation that a Bayonetta variant is in the main timeline slash universe. So we have our Bayonetta and now this Bayonetta. Wow, that takes me back, oh my god. I'm still not sure about Bella Portobello, so let's keep her out of this for now. Is this why the Coven of Bayonettas is going to be involved? Because a variant has crossed a threshold of the rules of the Bayoverse. After five fucking years, we finally get some continuity footage from the 2017 teaser. I've had so many DMs saying this is the original Bayonetta from Bayonetta 1 that was plucked from the past. Well, great effort, and I know you're excited, but I don't think so. For now. The first time I saw this, I immediately thought 2017 teaser because there was no mole and thanks to my awesome guy Krillian for helping me out with the graphics, the guns do not match our Bayonetta Scarborough affair from the first game. If anything, and of course they may have updated the design because it's been over five years, but this curved line and loop seems to match up with the Whittingham Fair one much better. But you may ask, how can she be here if she seemed to have been cut in half and killed by the purple figure in the teaser? I usually say to that that these teaser trailers are metaphors of what's about to happen. What if she wasn't killed? What if this attack transports you to another universe that they desire? Like the TVA and Loki, and that's why she ends up here. In the darkness where all civilizations have been destroyed and all humankind has been wiped out, you will face an unknown enemy, neither an angel or demon. Bayonetta, who has survived this fierce battle, was completely exhausted and covered in wounds. Fires a bullet containing humanity's last hope. Wow, they're chucking a near automata with this. <laughs> okay, so just to visualize it easier, think of the Whittingham Fair Bayonetta from another pocket universe universe and somehow is in our one now. But she is confirmed to be from a universe where civilization is gone, which sounds kind of familiar to the end chapter that we've all been confused about ever since Bayonetta 2. That universe was confirmed by Kamiya to be a parallel universe as well. Keep these two things in mind because I promise you this is going to be a really cool pocket theory. I promise you it's worth it. Additionally, assuming this scene is a pocket universe or another universe which was on the brink of collapse, I theorize this confirms the purple figure to be bolder or more accurately a lopter variant of her her universe, which ended up winning in their version of the fight. To put it into perspective, in our universe, we ended up winning against Bolter, but in the Whittingham Fair Bayonetta's one, she didn't, and this Bolter variant is much more unforgiving and has a new different form. I theorize that this green meteor that lands a few blocks away are the following possibilities from least probable to most probable. One, it's her timeline's John because of that recurring motif that Cereza and John always fought together in times of final battles. And two, remember I told you to keep the end chapter in mind, that other Sereza or Bayonetta from the end chapter, because her parallel universe was also on the brink of extinction. And here is where it possibly gets much more interesting. This could set up the perfect shonen moment where all three outfits and therefore variants of Bayonetta are in one universe. And that sounds kind of familiar. We have our Bayonetta, the witch with no memories. We have this Sereza, the witch with memories. And finally, we have that Cereza. Ultimately, this pioneers the triple goddesses of the Bayoverse. And Maddie, Umbran Wiggs, I know that's one of your favorite hopes. I'm hoping for that as well. Shoutouts to you. Or three, it's the purple figure in that same teaser trailer because evidently they were the only ones in that scene. But you also have the fourth possibility. I initially theorized this to be Viola and how she came into this universe because in this new screenshot, she is donning a Wanderer's cloak. It seems to be the same setting as well. But upon further inspection, she's also confirmed to be in Enzo's car in this new photo to what I think is during the Battle of New York, which confirms Maeve's eagle eyes, where she was seen to be in the release date trailer as well. Shoutouts to you, Maeve. And stick around for the end for her recent video. However, to counter my own counter, if you go to the character page, she is said to fall from the sky and ask for our Bayonetta for help, also noting that her strength is still yet to be improved. So therefore, she could be that same green meteor that ended up falling. In terms of development news, we also get a confirmation of her Japanese seiyu, Miyuki Sawashiro, who's done a ton of voice Voices. For all you Genshin fans, she voiced Raid and Shogun. Shoutouts Eve, Viva, Sniper, Ghost Cat, and Ace Asai. She also voiced Kirari Momabani for you Kakigurui fans. Shoutouts to you, Raida. I hope you are getting well soon, my man. And Jolin from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So we have another all-star coming in for Bayonetta 3. For Viola, personally, it definitely feels like it's Bayonetta's daughter speaking. <laughs> Ashidematoi ni wa naranoi de ne?
Kitty. I'm sorry, Peyu John fans. It's just how it's looking so far. But on the bright side, since she fell from the sky, it could be that she is the daughter of Luca and Bayonetta from another universe and not our one. So there is still hope for our Bayonetta and our John. Very happy. I'm happy too. Don't worry. <laughs> if she's the one who fell from the sky, I still have reason to believe that she has this ulterior motive of malice. Because if the possibility of her being the purple figure is true, why was she trying to get rid of Bayonetta or a Bayonetta? I still think she is only saying one side of the story during this explanation. The next cinematic is what seems to be before the wedding ship scene where we finally see Ah, she has milk glutes on. Oh my gosh, while she's grocery but this also made me fan guy because we finally have Mari Shimazaki's drawing from the Bayonetta 1 art book as a canon outfit. And I swear, we better be able to don this outfit in the game. Skyscrapers rise under the blue sky and the city is filled with the same liveliness of people as usual. There was a woman walking in the crowd, attracting the attention of those around her. Her name is Bayonetta. A girl's voice reaches her head. Lend me your strength before it's too late. Wait. This, that sounds familiar. I believe our Bayonetta will sense some sort of calling from that second timeline. She'd hear the little one's voice. Help! Help I thought about that scenario for a bit and I theorized the following is going to be the case for that girl's voice. Initially, the moment she hears it, she will get a deja vu callback to the little Cereza or reminiscing the events of Bayonetta 1 to give that nostalgia boost. But she will think that it's just her mind playing with her. Shoutouts to you, Thunder Strange. But in actuality, it ends up being Viola, which is a cool parallel because it might just be her actual daughter who literally calls her mommy. I know, I know. Bayo John fans. I feel your pain too. Or that voice could be the Whittingham Bayonetta who is currently fighting the purple figure. Moving on, she reveals her Bayonetta 3 dress A, which is actually a makeshift one from the curtain behind her, which oh my God is so f***ing beautiful. I cannot wait to see more, but it's a unique and smashing way to show how creative she is compared to her already just donning the outfit in Bayonetta 2. I also saw this as an indirect nod to Marilyn Monroe's famous counter where they could wear anything, a curtain or a potato sack, they'd still slay the scene, shutting everyone up. This is obviously before the attack of the cruise ship which then we will see her transformation sequence once again for the third time. This one has a very aquatic Little Mermaid clam-like design which reminded me one of the John concept dress from Bayonetta 2 and I think this outfit would go themingly well with her mermaid glasses. Oh sh I think I'm turning into Alan and like, no! Did you know that in Bayonetta 3, Bayonetta makes her dress from the floral curtain behind her. She's had all her expensive dresses destroyed prior battle. So a curtain is much more cheaper to replace because Bayonetta learns from her mistakes. But then you have this cool little fight scene from a different angle, her reaction to getting the new hammer slash railgun weapon, which she pole dances on, oh my god. Her drinking a beverage likely made by Radon, which are both a fun little callback to Bayonetta 1's opening scene upon receiving a weapon and taking a drink. It then follows up with a scene towards the end of the Battle of New York arc. There are a few more videos, but before that, there are beautiful 1080p resolution images of a variety of character art, including the main cast. After this video, you can visit my Twitter, so that way you can see these 1080p resolution images. But I love the new Trinity of Realities glyph, which is a smashing upgrade, or at least another interpretation different from the Gates of Hell bar one and Bayonetta 2's hieroglyphs. But I managed to get the source code image, and upon reading the infernal texts and translating them, I found out that is just a bunch of random letters. Yeah, I'm sad too. But I absolutely love the Noaten-like imagery and it's a fun way to refer back to the legend of Aesir or Bayonetta too. I love all the characters of Bayonetta, even if they've been here all this time, because it's just like seeing old friends again, even if they come back for like two seconds as a flashback. Scrolling down even more, there's the usual blurb of people who usually live here do not know the existence of angels and demons. However, it is said that there are places in this world that are close to Paradiso and Inferno, which I believe is going to be the potential new portals or the new Alfheim equivalent, where there use the terminology from the Yggdrasil tree. I am hoping for Niflheim because it sounds so cool. But this blurb is also a cool reference to Radan's Gates of Hellbar since he opens up portals that are near or close to these realms. Moving on to the screenshots, these are all the ones I could dig up from the source code before we move on to the new Viola and Bayonetta footage. We have Enzo carrying a passed out Viola, which I believe is during the scene in the Battle of New York. It could be different, but if she is that green meteor, how come she appeared in this scene in Enzo's car, which is before the meteor scene, unless this green meteor is is someone else. Things don't really add up at this point on, or I can't really see it, which is good. So that way we won't have the full picture when we finally blindly play the game. We have this screenshot of Whittingham Fair Bayonetta in which I hope is not the final battle scene because it does have that sort of vibe, but it looks like we'll be able to use her character in Bayonetta 3. I have a feeling also we'll be able to experience Bayonetta 1 mechanics in Bayonetta 3. And the perfect fitting way to do that was to introduce the Whittingham Fair Bayonetta variant. So that way it's not just a reskinned outfit. This is 
also how I think we'll be able to use Panther within, Umbran Spear, and Crow within again, since our Bayonetta seems to not use them anymore, because it looks like Demon Masquerade just made them obsolete. This is where a playable Whittingham Fair Bayonetta comes in, for those who miss those features. So Bayonetta Gen 1ers, rejoice! Hopefully they keep the Bayonetta 1 feeling in the Whittingham Bayonetta variant. There's a screenshot of Viola with a passed out soldier in the background, which I believe she beat up after the soldier tried to contain a potential otherworldly threat. This scene is likely after she lands in this universe if she is that green meteor, and this Wanderer cloak, I love it, could literally confirm her being the purple figure, holy shit, because the purple figure has a flowing coat as well. But you see these Elsa looking like icicles, which I feel are just a part of her aesthetic and magic, or maybe someone has her under a sort of glyph or seal magic. Not me thinking it's adult Loki sensing a disturbance in the force of chaos because he is now potentially guarding chaos. But yeah, wishful thinking. Next up, we have two more prologue shots of her and oh my gosh, I can't Take it. Another shot of our Bayonetta in Enzo's car. This medieval scene, which I believe is in China during their Asia arc, and possibly before they meet Bella Porchbe, judging by the dragon bell and the architecture. Another shot of the wedding before the attack, but everyone let me know who you think is getting married during the scene in the comments below. Why is Bayonetta at this wedding? The funnier, the better. Maybe she is there undercover for potential enemy attacks, and they end up being homunculi. There's another angle of those homunculi ships, which is likely during Viola's explanation of the homunculi in general. This beautiful underbelly shot of a building like likely the same one from the gameplay trailer, but this is definitely a nod to Platinum Games' as building in real life Osaka, which you can even Google map. But that's cool how they referenced it in Bayonetta 3. You have another shot of the New York cityscape, judging by the yellow taxis, in much better shape as they've probably recovered after the events of Bayonetta 2's city attack. And a gameplay screenshot with these awesome terracotta warrior-like statues outside the Chinese temple, likely before the train and Bella Porch Bayer comes in. It'd be awesome to see if these warriors were China's or Asia's equivalent of Lumen Sages, or they have their own magical art. Avatar fans, Crazy Gal the Infinite Avatar, I'm looking at you. But you then have this awesome cinematic of more angles of Viola, explaining at least her side of the story to Team Bayonetta at Radan's Gates of Hellbar. I really hope Radan can see through her potential bullshit and ends up saying that he knew all along to Bayonetta towards the end, but didn't interfere because it was none of his concern. <sighs> Classic Radan. But then, what if a Radan variant comes into their universe and you know what I'm hoping for, a full Radan cinematic where he finally comes into the story to fight. Therefore, Radan versus Radan. It would be perfect. If they are going to hint that in the very beginning, Radan is going to fight his variant. Imagine him saying, the only one who can defeat me is me. And then Bayonetta just shrugs it off. And then at the end, he ends up fighting himself from another universe, who probably wants to take over our world. Our Radan is going to be our best defense against him. I call this the Meliodas Syndrome, where in writing, you have the main characters fighting the story villain, while a side character who is said to be the strongest fights the actual strongest or technically strongest character, so that way the fights are separate. And you don't have the cliche of the main character being the absolute strongest all the time. There's another scene of Viola continuing her fight in that Jade Castle, but this time with Bayonetta. So it looks like that scene in the release date trailer, she was fighting alongside her, which makes sense. She doesn't have the full capabilities to kill high-ranking homunculi by herself, at least canonically for now. It ends with this adorable scene of her high-fiving Bayonetta after they win, showcasing her dorky side, and it's like she just won her first homunculi fight. You also have to look at the gameplay mechanics of this game, as well as breaking down the IGN and Nintendo Life reviews and the battle portion of the website. And this video is where we will start to break it down all for you. I'm Rockin', and never get disheartened.